Well, good morning, church. Please stand. We're going to read Acts 19, 1 through 7. We're marching through the book of Acts. If you're visiting with us today, this is kind of how we roll. And so uh, it's been a couple of years as we've gone through Acts today. We're in Acts 19, 1 through 7. We'd like to read out loud, so if you would, please join us. The words are on the screen. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, and that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. They were about 12 men in all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, so here's where we're at. We're on Paul's third missionary journey in the book of Acts, uh, Acts 19. And here's what we read, that it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, we talked about Apollos last week, uh, Paul passed through the inland country, that would be Asian Minor, and came to Ephesus. All right, so let's throw up our map. We'll look at uh, where Ephesus is. We actually circled it, so I don't even need a pointer. And uh, there it is. It's a wonderful city. If you've ever had a chance to be there, Chris and I had a chance to go as we did a tour in the footsteps of Paul. Just, they called it the largest outdoor museum in the world because there's so much of it that has been preserved, a beautiful city. Uh, it was a very important city in the ancient world. Uh, this is some of the ruins that, let me throw that picture over there, some of the ruins that you can see even to this day. Absolutely beautiful. The, uh, it was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. Now, when you think of Asia, you think of a continent, you know, but Asia was just a province of ancient Asia Minor there. The population of, of, uh, of Ephesus was close to 250,000 people. So this would have made it one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, and it was famous for this amazing uh, temple to Artemis. And, and that's an artist rendition probably drawn to scale. It's just absolutely huge. In fact, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world, uh, of the ancient world. And so tens of thousands of people would come to, uh, to partake of that. If, well, and Ephesus was a port city. If you, if you go there now, there's no water that comes up to Ephesus. But that's just because it's all silted in. But it used to be a port city. So many, many people would come to worship in the temple of Artemis. That was really kind of the centerpiece of the city. Um, we'll talk more about that as we get into other stories based here in Ephesus in our series. But I want to return back to the text because even before we, he really starts dealing with the citizens of Ephesus, he come, Paul comes into the city and he meets these 12 men. And let's pick up the story there at the end of verse 1. There Paul found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So Luke is actually telling a story that's not all that different from last week's story with Apollos. Remember, Apollos was a very gifted orator and, and was a champion uh, teaching in the synagogues. And, but he, he only knew John's baptism. And once again, we see that these, uh, these men only understand John's baptism. Now, let me just explain a little bit about that. If you remember, early in all four Gospels, we, we meet John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. And his message was repentance. It was judgment and repentance. I mean, he, you know, he was a prophet in the wilderness, right? Can, convicting people of their sin and of their need to repent. And he would call them to repentance there in, in the river and baptize them and so on. And we, and we discover in the Gospel of John, which is a different John, that's John the Apostle, uh, that when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the Holy Spirit brought conviction to John the Baptist that Jesus was the Messiah 
But then later, John the Baptist is imprisoned, and he begins to have his doubts that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this is a really awkward part about the Gospels. By the way, if you're writing myth and legend, you don't put that the guy who's a forerunner of Jesus doubts that Jesus is the Messiah. That's historical, right? It's awkward. But it's true. Why? Because John the Baptist, like everybody else, had expectations of the way that Jesus should be behaving as a Messiah, and uh, Jesus didn't meet his expectations. And so he literally sends his followers in Luke 7, verse 19, to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or, or shall we look for another? Remember that? And Jesus says, go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, good news is proclaimed to the poor, Right? But then John dies. He, his head is cut off before Jesus is crucified and resurrected. What is the validation that Jesus is the Messiah? It's the resurrection, right? John the Baptist never knew about the resurrection. He didn't even know about the crucifixion. He was dead. So the followers of John the Baptist, who were many, his influence spread deeply within the ancient world, they knew the message of repentance. They probably have heard rumor that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Messiah, but they have not yet connected the dots between Jesus the Messiah and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul is doing now is he's quoting their leader back to him. They're saying, here's what John the Baptist actually said. Look at Luke uh, 3, 16 through 17. Here's what John the Baptist preached. I baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I, is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. I mean, John had a very clear prophecy of the coming Messiah who would baptize with the Holy Spirit with fire. And Paul says... John the Baptist was talking about Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. So upon learning, these 12 men, upon learning that Jesus is the Messiah who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire, they submit then to baptism in his name. Let's pick it up there, verse five. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. All right, does that sound familiar? Where have we seen this happen before? We've seen it happen twice before in the book of Acts. The first was the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and they were empowered to be able to proclaim the gospel in all kinds of languages they couldn't possibly have known, and everyone heard the gospel in their native tongue, right? Then, once again, when Peter was ministering and proclaimed the gospel to a Gentile, Cornelius, and his family and staff, the Holy Spirit once again came upon all of them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying as a sure sign that the Holy Spirit had come upon them in faith, right? That, that they were filled with power. And now, here we are, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, with Jews from the diaspora, the dispersed Jews, and once again, upon believing in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon them with power. Don't get bent out of shape about the speaking in tongues and prophesying. It's not the, the, the exact uh, example of power. It is the fact that they are doing that which they could never have done in the flesh. So the evidence of the Holy Spirit is always power. And that leads us uh, to three major things I want to talk about this morning. Number one, the question. Number two, the answer. And number three, the hope of the gospel. First, the question. Why did Paul ask this question? Of these 12 men. Think about it. If I walked into a room, you were, you were being good religious people... And I looked at you and I said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why would I ask that question? I would only ask that question if you were giving me reason to doubt that you did receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, right? And I think that's exactly the situation. Paul meets these 12 guys that call themselves disciples. They're very religious. 
that there's no power. There's no conviction. There's no assurance. Something's notable about them. Something's missing. And he's asking them this question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? You know, I wish I had the courage of Paul because there's probably several people every week that I meet in my life who claim to be Christians that I would like to ask that question. You know, to the constant complainer, the man who gets so easily irritated and constantly gripes about everything, sir, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? To the woman who constantly worries, constantly frets, she has no peace, no assurance, ma'am, I ask you, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? To the professor of religion who plants doubt and disillusionment into the fertile minds of his students, professor, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? To the pastor who uses his position and influence to bring glory and honor to himself, pastor, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? To the man who can never get enough, who tramples people underfoot to make as much money as possible and has no room in his heart for the poor, sir, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Oh, and to my brother, the one who comes to church every Sunday living a double life cheating on his wife while playing the role of a church-going husband and father, brother. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It's a confrontational question. Make no mistake. And this question steps on a lot of toes, likely even in this room at our Warnell campus within all who are within the sound of my voice. It makes you stop and ask, doesn't it? If you answer yes to this question, I know that I received the Holy Spirit when I believed. Here's a couple things that are biblically absolutely given. Number one, you have received power. You have been reborn. The old is gone, the new has come. And you now in your transformed world are increasingly being comforted, purified, sanctified, prompted, and enlightened by the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit living in you. You are assured of your salvation because you know that you know that you know. It's personal. Christ lives in you. Your life now increasingly reflects the fruit of the Spirit that Paul describes in Galatians 5 as love and joy, and peace, patience in times of tribulation, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. As the great Charles Spurgeon once wrote, if we have believed in Christ correctly, the Holy Spirit has come upon us to transform us altogether. By divine grace, we are not now what we used to be. We have new thoughts, new wishes, new aspirations, new sorrows, new joys. And these are created in us by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, Paul's question is confrontational. And some of us, whenever we get a confrontational question from the Bible, from a pastor, we feel like we're being judged because of what you think God wants from you or what the pastor wants from you. Listen, this isn't what Paul wants from them. It's what he wants for them. There's so much at stake in this one question. Eternity is at stake. Peace, comfort, strength, and assurance are at stake. Sanctification and the liberation of the soul are at stake. Paul writes in Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Is there a more important question I could be asking you for for all of eternity this morning? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? The presence of the Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation. 
The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of our salvation. The power of the Holy Spirit is the source of our victory and hope in this life and the certainty of our hope for all eternity. So now we're asking, but how can I know? Just get to the end. How can I know? How can I know if the Holy Spirit lives in me? Paul writes in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How does he do that? I'll tell you he does it in my life, and I think very commonly how he does it in the lives of many people. One of the telltale signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is prayer. Those who lack the Holy Spirit will not pray. If they do pray, it's mechanical and rote, and they have no faith. But if the Holy Spirit is in you, he prompts you to pray all day long. Pray for her. Intercede for him. Pray against that darkness. Pray for salvation for that person. Pray for healing for this person all day long. How many of you know that you're being prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray all day long? It just happens. You don't have to set aside prayer time. I mean, maybe you should set aside prayer time, but it doesn't happen in a little, little quiet time, right? It's just all day long the Holy Spirit prompts and convicts people to pray. Why is that? Romans 8, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not even know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the believers according to the will of God. The Spirit will be interceding through you for the will of God. If the Holy Spirit's in you, that's part of your life. Here's another thing. Does God work powerfully through your life in ways that you could never accomplish on your own? See, when the Holy Spirit is in us, God will speak through us. God will serve through us. God will prophesy and lead and heal and sing and pray He'll do something very significant through the life of the believer that we could never do through the flesh. Those are called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every believer is empowered to do ministry of some kind in some way that you can never do just through your flesh, just through your own natural competencies. So I need to ask you, do you see the power of God working through your life? Do other people comment and acknowledge that they see the power of God working through your life? If not, then I have to ask you the question that Paul asked of these 12 men, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, I suspect that there are those here today who have never believed. That's okay. I'm so glad that you're here. But of course, you have not received the Holy Spirit. And then I suspect that there are many people, <clears throat> you know, you're a good religious person, you've been trying very hard to be a good person your whole life, but everything that I've talked about in terms of the Holy Spirit is completely foreign to you. You really would have to say honestly, no, I, I don't understand at all what you're talking about, about the Holy Spirit. And then there are those of us who once felt so alive with the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit, but now our, our faith has grown dim. And we question whether the Holy Spirit is yet in us. To so all three groups of you, of all three groups, all, any of you who fit into those three descriptions, the most important question then is this. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? How might we once again be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit? Is it through baptism? Does somebody have to lay hands on us? Do, do we need to be particularly good or, or moral to receive the Holy Spirit? No, no, and no. So let's look at the answer that is in the text. It's right there. Do you see it? Paul makes a very clear assumption, and here it is. You should have absolutely, you should absolutely receive the Holy Spirit when you believe. Believe what? Believe Jesus. When we surrender ourselves to the lordship of Jesus, when we believe upon Jesus as the one who died in our place, when we call upon the name of Jesus with faith, when we're broken in our repentance and yet confident in his grace, 
When we put into practice the things he said, do this, and we go do that. Then and only then does the Holy Spirit take pleasure in taking up residence in our lives. You're saying, well, but look, I mean, I accepted Christ when I was nine years old and I went down and I, I got baptized. And, and I was always told that if, you know, if, if, you, if you accept Christ and you're baptized, you have the Holy Spirit. But I mean, I don't really feel like I have the Holy Spirit. But I mean, I know that I probably do because I got baptized when I was nine. Listen. The Holy Spirit does not reside within us because we once believed. The Holy Spirit resides within us whenever we believe. Whenever we have faith and demonstrate our trust and our belief in Jesus. If you no longer feel the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, I can just tell you right now, you're not believing Jesus. You might still believe in the doctrine of Christianity. You're just not believing in him. You're not in a relationship that says, I am trusting you with this, with my life, with my money, with my time, with my career, with my marriage, with my kids, with, with everything. Maybe you're just trusting him with nothing. Remember the great quote of Dallas Willard, to believe that something is true is to act as though it is so. Do you long for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit? Then believe Jesus and act as though he is your Lord. Trust him and do what he says. Yield to your king and you will know the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I have to ask you this very awkward question. I, I'm sorry. As if this message isn't already awkward enough. Do you long? Do you care? Do you hope for it? Do you desire the power, assurance, comfort, and gifting of the Holy Spirit in your life? Or are you thinking, yeah, not really. I just, I just want enough faith to where when I die, I go to heaven. Just enough faith to squeak in. That's it. I really am not all that interested in all that stuff you just talked about. Don't really want the Holy Spirit interrupting my life. Telling me what to do. Telling me what to pray for. Certainly don't want him interrupting, you know, my stuff. Old Charles Spurgeon, he writes, a little religion is a miserable thing. He who has just enough to save him at last may not have enough to comfort him for the present. He who has much grace and is filled with the Spirit of God shall have two heavens, a heaven here and a heaven hereafter. Bill Brooks was in our first service. His, Mary, his, his wife, Mary, passed away a few years ago of ALS. Many of us knew Mary very well. She was very close to our family. When she discovered that she had ALS, which is probably about the worst news that you can possibly ever get, her heaven shone out of her. She was not afraid. She was not angry. She was not bitter. She knew where she was going. She knew who Jesus is. She knew that she was a child of God. And she maintained peace and serenity and joy till her last breath, and I was there. That is heaven on earth. You're saying heaven on earth, but you don't get ALS. No, it's not. In this life, you will have many troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. You want to be an overcomer. You want to be able to walk through the darkness, which is this life on this side with power and courage and assurance and joy, you need the Holy Spirit. There is no other way. Which leads us now to the hope of the gospel, which is for all of us. Because you know what? It doesn't matter. If, if you've never even accepted Christ or you've been a Christian all your life and you're the most Holy Spirit-filled person in this room, here's what I can tell you. God has more for you. <laughs> He's got more for you than you could ever hope or even imagine. Even the most surrendered life in this room is one who's not fully surrendered. Oh, trust me, I know. 
There is yet ground to be tilled, rocks to be removed, territory to be yielded in your life. So no matter if you are yet to call upon the Lord, you've been a Christian your whole life, if you want what God has in store for you, for your purpose, for the time that remains, it comes with his Holy Spirit, period. So listen, some of you are thinking, I'm feeling a little shamed. I'm feeling like here I've been in church my whole life, here I've been, I've been really trying to be a good person, doing it. and all these things you're talking about, the Holy Spirit's like, I, I long for that, but why don't, you know, I mean, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. This is a very common story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story that blow your mind. True story. Dr. Kent Hughes writes about this in his commentary. It's the story of John Wesley. How many of you heard of John Wesley? I hope you've heard of John Wesley. All right. He's one of the most influential Christians who ever lived. You know, kind of started the whole Methodist denomination, if you will. Listen. John Wesley was born to a clergyman, preacher's son, wife, uh, was a very devout woman, so he had a very devout Christian family and a very privileged upbringing. He attended Charter House in Oxford and became a double professor of Greek and logic at Lincoln College. He also served as his father's assistant in the church, was ordained by the church. While at Oxford, he was a member of the Holy Club. They didn't call themselves that, but they were nicknamed by the other students because this group of students so seriously tried to cultivate their spiritual lives. Finally, he accepted an invitation from the Society of Propagation of the Gospel to do what? To become a missionary to the American Indians in Georgia. Gets on a boat. He goes over there. He fails miserably. Terrible failure. In fact, <laughs> he had to go back to England. And he writes in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Not all was lost, however, because in his time in America, he had encountered the Moravians, whose living faith deeply impressed him. So upon his return to London, he sought out one of the leaders, and to use Wesley's own words, he was clearly convinced of unbelief, of the want of that faith whereby alone we are saved. This, after being raised in his faith his entire life, going to church, preacher's kid, even went out on the mission field, he came to a point of brutal honesty of understanding, I just actually don't trust God. I believe information, I just have no faith. Until one night, in the evening of May 24, 1738, Wesley wrote this in his journal. He said, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street where a man was reading Luther's preface to the epistle in Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sin, e even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Do you hear the change? Wesley went from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus. He went from believing the doctrines and you know, being a proponent of the doctrines of Christianity to having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding in the brutal honesty the darkness of his own sin, his own doubt. But then at that moment came faith and the assurance of the Holy Spirit, that he was a child of God, that his sins had been forgiven, changed his entire life. In fact, historians rank John Wesley's personal conversion as equal to the significance of the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution as one of the great historical phenomena of the 19th century. We've said it a thousand times. We will never comprehend the power of one life fully surrendered to Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, many of you know my own testimony. It's actually quite similar to that of John Wesley, though my conversion will not likely be equated with the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> right? But I was a believer, a church-going 
young man. I had wonderful Christian parents. I, I, I loved, you know, going to church. I was very involved with that. I mean, I, I, it's to the best that I knew, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I got into college. My faith began to crumble. I got into seminary. It completely unraveled. Until one morning in 1995 in the Princess Seminary Chapel where I cried out, I, I gotta know. And I saw my sin and it was horrific. And then I met the living Lord, the love of Christ and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I knew that I knew that I knew I am forgiven. I am remade. That was the beginning of my new life that is still unfolding and, and being sanctified even to this day. Friends, listen. Do not be satisfied with the lies of our culture that there is no God, there's no power, there's no hope, there's nothing to live for, nothing to die for, there's no heaven, there's no hell. That's a lie. And do not despair because you have long embraced a cold and sterile religion. And do not be ashamed that you long for more of the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer. Listen, it is good news for all of us. Believe upon the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Take him at his word. Surrender your life to Jesus. Trust him. Do what he says, and you will receive the Holy Spirit with power and fire. You will be born again. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we close our service, we're just so grateful for this very awkward, confrontational, and loving uh, conversation that Paul had with these 12 men, many of whom are probably very similar to people like us people who want to be part of the movement and generally agree with the information, but our lives lack power, conviction, and assurance. If we're honest, we don't see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and neither does anybody else. But Lord, we long for all that you have for us, for all the power, all the purpose, the assurance. So Lord, we believe And we ask that you help us with our unbelief. We pray that you would minister to that place in our lives that we might be emboldened to live by faith, to put our trust in you and and live as though it is true, that you are our king, that we are your stewards, that we are saved by grace and it's not of our own doing so that we would stop trying so hard to impress you, that we might just be your children grafted in and adopted into the great kingdom of God. Fill us now with your Holy Spirit. May we be a church known for the power of your Holy Spirit working in and through us in all the places where we move. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.